that's still useful, whereas up on top, relatively, it's, it's not so important. There's no heat really lost out there because mm. it's bone and it's thick and, you know, used for headbutting. Especially <laughs> in my case. <laughs> <laughs> no, that makes so much sense. Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. Hey everyone, welcome to another free podcast. We keep these podcasts free for you guys by being funded by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness. So a quick favor to ask you, if you could put this video on pause for just a moment and go to ihda.ie, that's ihda.ie, and have a look at the home page and scroll down to the share buttons and help us get the message out on the calcification scan and its ability to save the lives of many middle risk people who have no awareness that they've got major heart disease going on inside their body. So if you can do that for us, we'll keep the podcast free. Today I'm in studio in Dublin, Ireland with none other than Keen Foley, who has written the book Don't Eat for Winter which is very good advice. And recently, Keen, you were on um, Brian Lenski, MD, and Tro. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there. Yes, yeah. yeah, it was a really interesting conversation, but unfortunately the, the sound quality wasn't excellent, you know, but it should be a lot better today, maybe. <laughs> oh, I think it will be. Yeah. Well, well, we'll see how we do. But I think in Ireland, we'd probably call the sound of ball of shite, maybe. Might yeah. be fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've written some slang books, so like ball of shite would be a pretty good description. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. <laughs> ah, no, don't worry about them. And just to throw on Brian, you know, in fairness, do a great job. Fantastic podcast. It's just, I think, the internet connection. Yeah, it was just an upload problem. I think that was on. Ah, yeah, very good. Actually, I'll just put that down a bit. So, don't eat for winter is such fantastic advice and it, it compiles together so much and you know what I love is you've got nutritional science, you've got biochemical science, but what they often skip is evolutionary science, you know, where we came from and what that tells us. And maybe it's best to start with this concept, don't eat for winter, and what it really means. Yeah, I suppose the main thing that it's about is avoiding the foods that occur in autumn time um, so if you look at what happens in nature um, in summer into autumn time carbs become abundant um, if you look at what's, what's there in March you can't get an apple off a tree in March you know if you're out in nature so basically what I did when I was looking at this concept first was I put into the I put into a spreadsheet all of the foods by their glycemic index and put them into a spreadsheet and then totaled it up and had a look and see what was there and I found there's a massive spike in carbohydrates in September and October. So if these foods exist in at that time of the year and combined with fats, you know, fats also um, start coming up at that time of year as well, that they must be causing some uh, biological kind of a process. And for me it was, you know, I was looking at my diet and I was eating things like oats and peanut butter for training purposes you know and um, I had been doing the paleolithic kind of diet um, for a good few years had lost a lot of weight I was up at 18 and a half stone and got down to about 14 stone with that and I was doing a lot of kettlebells I was training really hard um, but it was like I, was, I, I looked at um, the way animals work in the animal kingdom if you look at a squirrel for example they put on 12% of their red squirrel maybe 25% of their grey squirrel and uh, no matter how much they scurry around collecting nuts and acorns and whatever they, they go around collecting, they can't outrun uh, autumn, you know? So how could we be expected to outrun the diet that we're exposed to today where everything essentially is an autumnal combination? So if you look at, if you go into any supermarket, any petrol station, um, any shop, you literally have to run the gauntlet through a, a corridor of uh, sweets and biscuits and pastries and all these different things and the combination that's in those uh, foods is a specific formula of carbs to fats to proteins that almost exactly match what occurs in nature in autumn time if you look at some of the signature foods of autumn itself such as the acorn you know and I kind of went that a lot um, in the, the, the book and the website and so on but um, 
there's only one other food in nature that matches the signature of an acorn almost identically, one natural food, and that's human breast milk. Right? And so I think that we're programmed from birth to seek out this formula. And it only occurs in nature in the autumn time. And so what I, what I kind of equate it to is like that the earth itself becomes almost like a lactating uh, mother in autumn, feeding its creatures so that they can survive a really bleak period of, of nature, which is the winter time, where cards start to decay. You know, you've only got a few root veg left by the time December comes along. And then in the spring, they're gone all, all together. So, um, really what it's about then is avoiding that combination because if you look at the standard Western diet, it's t literally every meal and snack that we have. Breakfast time is, you know, your, you know, your cereals with milk, um, maybe some nuts as well. Um, you're looking at lunchtime then, you're having paninis with mayonnaise and, and your little bit of meat in it. Uh, dinner time then might be fries, might be uh, spaghetti bolognese, again carbs and fat combinations and then all the snacks in between them as well, so your cookies with your tea, um, you know, the, sh the sweet sugary drinks then added in on top of it and the list kind of goes on and on and on, so we're eating like six times, eight times a day these autumnal combinations, so we're never giving our bodies a chance, we're basically eating for this winter that doesn't um, ever materialise, so I put it like we're living in this infinite autumn, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I used to say years ago, winter never comes. And that's the problem. Yes. Because even if we ate this junk food for a couple of months a year, which wouldn't be a good idea, obviously, but if we ate this junk food, at least after a couple of months, we'd have 10 months, let's say, of no junk food, eating meat, fish, eggs, and real food. And in that case, you'd get away with it. Probably would, yeah. yeah. But I mean, our problem is that we're eating hyper-processed versions of this. So it's like an uber autumn on steroids, essentially. And so we just never give our bodies a chance, you know, and we're not just eating for one winter, you know, by the time we're 20 years of age, we've eaten for 80 winters, you know, and that's kind of how I look at it, you know. So it was only when I stopped eating like that, did the weight come off in a, in a dramatic kind of a way, and did it take the, you know, the form that I probably should have since I'm, I think, like, I, I was a, a very fit young man, I was, in school I was nicknamed Chubby, I was a, a fat child, and... I, I kind of moved into the teenage years and in order to lose weight in my teenage years uh, obviously the hormones were kicking in and all that stuff but um, it took severe low fat type diet uh, that was totally restrictive and um, misery essentially to lose the, the weight at that stage and it never fully went off and it was always soft and it never built the, the muscle that it could have built had I been living the other way which is more protein, you know, more fats in the diet, healthy fats, that kind of stuff. And so it's really, it was really when I started looking at the Paleolithic diet that um, I was, it kind of turned everything on its head. I originally was brought up thinking low fat is the way to go. And you know, the way we were led down a, a path with high carb diets and so on. And it was only when I was shifted to that and started eating lots of nuts and lots of avocados and fat and all that kind of stuff did it, did it change and uh, I was shocked by that, that I was losing weight but yeah it, should, it, it looked like I was eating potentially more calories because obviously there's more calories in fat per gram than, than carbohydrates so that, that shocked me initially but again my weight got stuck at a certain point and so when I got stuck at a certain point then I was looking at diets, a friend of mine is a diabetic type 1 and she was talking about how she, you know, the insulin, injecting insulin every day to, to deal with her carbohydrates that she was eating. So then I thought to myself, well, what's, what is it about carbohydrates that are, that are causing the problem? And looked out the window of my house one day and it was in March and there was no apples on the trees. And I just thought to myself, look, it's obvious that there's, an, there's actually no carbs. If you look anywhere in, in March, there's no corn in the fields, no wheat in the fields. There's nothing, no berries, you know, there's no apples, there's no fruit. Um, literally everything is bleak, you know. All that's available if you're a hunter-gatherer will be what you stored or hunting, you know, the meat that's out there and available in nature. So I started looking at diet from that point of view and I said, look at the combinations that I would, would have been eating in autumn time and avoid those and separate them out. And, you know, I'd heard that from dietitians as well, that you shouldn't be eating... You know, for because of the instant response, you shouldn't be eating carbs and fats at the same time anyway. So I was looking for a kind of fundamental reason mm -hmm. for that. And the fundamental reason was that these foods exist only in autumn time. And it was only later, after a lot of research, a lot of time, 
did a lot of more pieces start coming together f- around the concept, which we can talk about as we go along, if you like, you know. Super keen. Yeah. And you know what? Yeah, that resonates powerfully. And I will admit uh, to the viewer here that we're going to pretty much agree with 100 percent of everything. But that's just the way it is. And it's not bias. It's because the nutritional science, the evolutionary science, the human history and paleoanthropology, uh, yada, 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 everything kind of consolidates, triangulates to this view. So it's just correct. So I, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Now you, you actually, this discovery, you had gotten really fit doing kettlebells, you were doing really well, but you got down to 90 something kilograms or let's say 210, 220 pounds for the US folks. But then you hit a plateau and even though you were doing massive muscle work, you were kind of still a little bit chubby. You were surprised you weren't ripped with all your work. Yes. The breakthrough, though, and maybe describe that, is when you discovered what you just described, cutting out the autumnal foods and going more to a Ted Naiman style, shall we say, kind of lower carb, certainly, but also a little lower fat and probably relatively higher protein. Cutting out the autumnal foods, is that's what drove your weight down big time. Yeah, so, I mean, I've been looking at bodybuilder diets and things like um, carb cycling and, you know, different... Mm different techniques and what I just decided to try was let's just separate carbs and fats altogether you know so I I started the day with uh, a high fat breakfast so it might be eggs and bacon or eggs and avocado I put seeds on it I'd put you know load load the breakfast up and then for lunch then it'd be more Ted Ted Naiman style which would be your you know protein and say some fibrous veg colorful veg and then in the evening time then I'd actually carb up so I'd have leaner protein again and some it could be rice it could be root veg it could be whatever so just get some glycemic foods in as well at at, at that time because i was going to be training and using using the glycogen and by doing that uh literally just melted off and it melted off to the point where like the six pack started showing and that was shocking to me i was actually I remember at the time just going around being giddy uh looking at going this is working you know mm-hmm. so then <clears throat> My wife saw what I was doing and she tried it herself. <clears throat> so she's training in the morning time. She was carving up for her breakfast, for her breakfast and then having the the, uh, the fattier stuff throughout the day. And she was doing the, the kind of three meals like that, keeping the carbs and fats separate. And she lost about the same percentage of, of body fat that mm-hmm. I did. And she got down to like 18% body fat, which is very low for, you well, know, yeah. yeah. And she was training, she was in circuit training and she was always trying to get below 64 kg. And she shifted down to like something like 54 kg, 56 kg, something like that. And um, she's, you know, it was just th- at that point, then I kind of re- was thinking to myself, well, obviously, there's something to this, you know. So just started researching different uh, concepts like um, the Paleolithic Prescription by Stanley by Eaton, who, mm-hmm. who, which I think is a fantastic book. It's from the 80s. And, and I think a lot mm-hmm. of people should read read that one. And uh, James V. Neal stuff as well, and uh, uh, stuff about the um, you know the the fat gene essentially that mm. certain people are susceptible to putting on body fat, and the people who are susceptible to putting on body fat tend to be more hyperphagic towards things like chocolate bars and and, and stuff like that. So I was just looking into that, and th- the one thing I noticed about most of these diets that are out there is that they're snapshots. So it's a st- static diet that you would have for the entire year, year essentially, or for the whole mm-hmm. lifetime of the diet itself. So if you look at our food pyramid, our food pyramid is uh, heavy carb at the bottom. Okay, they've mm-hmm. shifted, they've shifted mm-hmm. vegetables down to the very bottom, but yeah. still we have, you know, seven bananas or something you can have, you know, if, if, you, mm-hmm. if you interpret it in a certain way, uh, you have all the cereals, potatoes, and all at the bottom. And if you eat like that uh, 12 months of the year or your whole lifetime, you know, when we're spring in that in the food pyramid, yeah. you know, so where's, you know, and so for me, it was like these diets are static. And if you look at uh, the ketogenic diet, which I think is a brilliant diet for people to, you know, to control their their insulin levels and, and get fat adapted and so on. But again, it's a snapshot diet because mm-hmm. it's one way of, of eating. And I think that nature is totally dynamic and yeah. i think that we should be looking at diet from that point of view you know in the summertime maybe look at eating slightly different in the autumn time look at eating slightly different and so on so i've been using that now recently in in bodybuilding actually i never thought i'd be bodybuilding in my 40s but i've been, i've 
competed in my, <laughs> in, on stage and uh, never thought I'd get into that condition. And what I've been doing is, in, now at the moment, I'm eating more autumnal. I'm actually eating some carbs and fats together to mm. bulk up a little bit because I want to gain strength. And mm. come into the winter, I, I shift it and bring the carbs down more, mm. bring the fat up a little bit. And then in the summertime, it's more carbs and less fat. And I kind of shift it along and try track along with nature. Ah. And it's, it just so happens that it times in perfectly with these natural bodybuilding comp- competitions that happen every year in September, because by the end of summer, I should be in kind of top condition, do you know? And of course, insulin, they say for bodybuilding, you don't necessarily need loads of carb, but I mean, the insulin is anabolic. So, you know, a little more carb might not do too much harm. Yeah, I don't think so. And for me, it's like, it's to go for, towards the minimum of the recommended daily, daily allowance rather than the maximum. The maximum is 65%, which would, which would equate to what, 1300 calories in a 2000 calorie diet kind of thing. Mm. So, I mean, to burn that off, you're talking about, you know, running a serious right, r- running race. So most people who are sitting in, the, in their offices working on a computer, um, it's just way too much sugar mm. for them to handle. And, you know, we have sugar taxes, we have, you know, all this stuff about sugar out there, but people don't talk about how easily starch is converted into, into glucose by the stump, you know, so it is sugar at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think Dr. David Unwin, a good friend of mine, has a great thing. He has teaspoons of sugar equivalent for potatoes, bread, everything else. Yes. And it really helps the man or woman in the street understand. So I have a few slices of bread. It's X teaspoons of sugar. It's glucose. It's sugar. Simply stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, and it makes a, a lot of sense, you know. And, and mm. like the glycemic index of some baked potatoes can be, you know, higher than a soft drink. Or it can be, you know, even some cereals that the... Uh, the number, if you do a search on the glycemic index, the number one entry in it is a cereal. I'm not going to say, <laughs> but it's like, I mean, these things are comparable to glucose in terms of how they affect your blood sugar. So, you know. Absolutely. And I mean, these cereals, these are refined grains, mechanically pulverized. So the speed of absorption is massive. Mm-hmm. The release of GIP hormone. I mean, they're kind of metabolic chaos fuels. And yet, like you say, they're at the base of the pyramid, which makes no sense. No, especially at the base of a pyramid that's static over, the, over uh, you know, your whole life. Yeah. And for I used to always joke about the office worker in his mid 40s or her mid 40s sitting and pushing a desk. That's very different than an insulin sensitive 27 year old athlete. I mean, the latter athlete may very well be able to eat quite a bit of this modern grain. Yeah. You know, without falling apart. But a middle aged person. It's, it's insane. It's insane, yeah. And, and, you know, it's not just, you know, the way with, with cereals, they're saying it's a 30, 40 gram serving. You know, people are eating twice that, you know, being realistic, you know. I, I love those, Keen, the uh, recommended servings. And sometimes I look at things with sugar in them or refined carb. And I look and I say, wow, the carb is quite low on that. And I'm surprised because I kind of know what the constituents are. And then I see it's per serving and the serving is a joke. Mm. So the cereal bowls, I've done it, you've done it, Mm. everyone's done it. You pour a bowl of cereal based on instinct, it's four supposed servings. Yes, exactly. Just like that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a lot of the cereals then have things like chocolate added in. And it's just, a you know, it's not a breakfast Mm. cereal. That's a, that's junk food, you know. It's it's dessert for breakfast, I think, yeah. is what some people say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you, as you were saying, four times what you know what's recommended on the side of the box, which is like forty grams or something like that. Mm. And you know that's probably okay. With, you know, not well, not four times it, but you know, you can we can handle something with high fiber, like oats, maybe things like that. That you know would give you a certain amount of you know uh, it would help you digesting the the carbs a little slower. But still, it's a lot of sugar in the body. And especially if you're eating carbs for breakfast, carbs for lunch, carbs for your 11s and in the early afternoon, you know, and so on. And like one of the things I've um, developed, I'm a software engineer, by the way. So my background is is computer science. But so I'm always looking at numbers. And um, <clears throat> one of the things I noticed was that there's a certain number of unnatural foods that also match the signature of um, acorns and autumnal foods. So I, I talk about acorns a lot um, mm-hmm. on Twitter. And the reason I talk about acorns is because they, we, ate, we ate them, okay? The human beings mm-hmm. ate them for thousands of years, long before farming. And they were an insurance policy. I mean, the Celts ate them, the Native Americans ate them, they still eat them in Korea. You know, mm. and all ancient texts in Greece and Rome, they talk about how warriors used to eat them. 
And people think of them today as like a, a famine food or, or something like that. But mm. a lot of acorns are almost edible um, without doing any sort of processing to them at all to leach the tannins out of them. But besides the fact that acorns can be quite edible and you can make flour out of them and do all sorts of stuff that mm. we do today with, with grains and mixing butter into it and milk into it, um, the, the other foods that are available in autumn time can be mixed together. So Granny's apple tart is a good example of it, like that we have apples and nuts and pecan nuts and walnuts and all these different foods, easy to combine together and to create that, you know, lovely recipes. Um, mm -hmm. And the, one of the best examples is trail mix, <clears throat> you know, a bit of dried fruit and some nuts. And if you eat, if you ate raisins or and nuts separately, they'd be quite more, more sati satiating than eating the two together, you know? Mm. So I think there's something really interesting about the combination and there's been a lot of research, you know, about the combination in, in terms of testing on rodents, but also recently with uh, in Yale University with Dana Small had a uh, uh, did a study on the valuation of carbs. So human beings actually value carbs and fats more than any other combination um, that, you know, and we actually would pay more for them. And if you look at <coughs> the a cinema is a good example of, it, of this. People go in there, you wouldn't go in and buy like a, a big tub of dry popcorn with no flavoring on it but yet we'll go in and spend 10 quid on you know if you pour hot butter on top of it yeah. all of a sudden it becomes a different thing altogether and our, our pupils dilate and we become this more more feral kind of a creature when it comes to eating the stuff you know and we throw in a bag of maltesers in on top of it or we'll eat you know a bag of crisps with some chocolate as well you know mm. so it's the combination for me is this killer and if you look at what's front loaded in all the shops uh, everywhere it's it's all about granola you know all of these things you can list out a, a bunch of them and the, f the formula of the acorn essentially is 53 percent fat 41 percent carb and six percent protein right and so it's a low protein the actual six percent protein is important as well and ted talks about uh, you know how low protein and high energy is a, is a problem but if you can get that combination together uh, i've written a, a little tool that will allow people to kind of put in the, the the food ratio in grams and it'll come up and show it show them how autumnal it is and i've put it like if you i've compared that with the usda food database and literally the i've, I've put it in in terms of how approximate the f foods match this formula and uh, literally there's only one natural food that matches that's human breast milk other than that it's a, a, a list of 200 200 uh, long list of junk foods so from danish pastries pizza fries cheeseburgers, you know, you, you name it, uh, crisps, chocolate, granola, popcorn and butter, uh, all these different things that we, we really value highly. So it kind of ties in with, with the research out there that we value this food and we're going to pay through the nose for it. And if you look at how shops have front loaded all this stuff in there as well, it all just kind of ties together. But I, I think that <clears throat> there's a fundamental reason why we go for that formula and it's protective. It's a natural instinct. It's, it's a, it goes back to our ev evolution. And if you look at what it, we, we, we value sugar, we value salt, we value certain flavorings, we value certain acids, you know, things like mm. vitamin C. We know when it's we can taste it and we know when it's in foods. Mm. And uh, I think the base of it all is like if you think of like a, a satiety pyramid or a, a, a hyperphagia pyramid, carbs and fats are at the bottom of it. And they're like it's like the filler. It's like the way we use bread today. So we use bread and mayonnaise put, to put um, meats on it. You know, on pizza, we put cheese on it. In, you know, in donuts, we put jam into it. So it's sweet and savory, but we use a base of carbs and fats together in it. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the past, we didn't have farming, we didn't have grains, we didn't have these high gluten kind of grains and things like that. But we did have this fall, of a massive amount of, of crops of acorns because, you know, Ireland was 100% forested. Parts of Europe were 100% forested. And it's post Ice Age when there wasn't a huge amount of humans there to chop them all down and use them for making mm -hmm. boats and so on. And the whole world was forested with, with, with these things, these trees, you know, and they were mm -hmm. ba basically the, the foundation of society. And every autumn, the massive crop fell and they were used, they were ground up, they were used as flour and are used to mix with fruits they were used to mix with savory stuff and the native americans did it until you know they were colonized over there and the celts used to do it and i think this base formula is as is like a um a fundamental thing that we've used to help us survive the the following period which is winter and this is what we seek we seek it because it was a survival advantage to 
gorge on it and put on a certain amount of weight for you know to mm. to as a, an insurance policy to get through the winter but so it's more than just putting on body fat right so body fat is part of it body fat um adds access as, you know an insulation layer people who swim a little bit of body fat is no harm for them um but also uh, as an energy backup supply but the, the main reason i think is is to do with uh, brown adipose tissue or bat you know it's brown mm -hmm. Uh, bat activation essentially because bat requires white fat first of all uh, white the, the jiggly stuff uh, mm -hmm. it needs to be browned it can be browned but we like human beings they've discovered recently have this area around their necks and shoulders that can be activated and um, uh, you know the brown brown tissue can be activated and that would act if you think, think where it is on the body it's you know it's a it's at the top of the body it's around the heart it's around you know mm -hmm. where we need to keep warm and human beings have naturally long hair so it would have also acted as a, a, a thermal insulation blanket that has its own heating system. And then you have the white fat as well then on your body to keep you more insulated. So in order for brown fat to be activated, it has to, you have to white fat first and you have to be browning a little bit of white fat and then activate it. And I think all those conditions happen from summer into autumn into winter in order for that to happen because brown fat is activated not only by cold which is probably mm -hmm. the number one for activating it so that you, you you're not shivering anymore when you, you want to stay warm but it also gets activated by high insulin high leptin levels at the same time and that only happens when carbs and fats are high in the diet and so if you look at what happens in autumn time it's browning white fat and then the next period then is carbs decay carbs go out of nature fat stays high because you still have fat animals that you're killing and eating mm -hmm. and you also have your own body fat to keep your leptin, le leptin levels up and at that point then leptin is high and that's really useful for activation of, of brown fat so high leptin and uh cold keeps your so you're you're setting the pile you're setting the, the you're building the the uh the fat forest then you're activating it and it lasts you through the winter it keeps you warm Exactly, Keen, and you're describing a perfect evolutionary machine that's been yeah. optimized for the very system which begat it or begat it or produced it. And just for people watching, so brown adipose tissue, it's actually, I think, it's brown because there's a lot of mitochondria and there's a lot of uncoupled energy production. So the brown fat can run freewheeling and produce just heat, heat. kind of waste yes. energy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a perfect kind yeah. of emergency heat source, like a little nuclear heat source. And it's right in at the top of your spinal column and around the, the crucial, the crucial organs. organs. Exactly. And like you say, the, the white adipose tissue, you've built up enough. Mm -hmm. It begets the brown fat and the leptin, which is a hormone from white adipose tissue, it raises if you have more stores. Mm -hmm. So that's triggering the brown fat and the insulin has fallen away fallen because away. Exactly. the summer has gone exactly. and the autumn's gone. Yeah. So now you're switched into winter survival mode. But I love what you just said there in Northern Europe, let's be honest in our evolution, when you get into winter, these carby fatty mixed foods and acorns, everything's gone. Mm -hmm. And you're left with animals who have been fattened from the very the same exactly, autumn. Exactly. So now you've it's got a fat and protein source along with your brown fat and, exactly. and the cold to activate, yeah, to activate it. it and, and evolution is beautiful. Yeah. And even <laughs> if, you perfect. Think, if you think about I know this is uh, probably gonna you know <laughs> um if you think about men right who have pattern baldness right they they don't lose the hair around the the you know so that comes down and and covers the the area so it's just extra that thermal around the the neck and shoulders you know that's and still useful whereas up on top of it, relatively it's, it's not so important there's no heat really lost out there because mm. it's bone and it's thick and you know used for head button especially <laughs> in my case <laughs> <laughs> no that makes so much sense so some people look at evolutional or evolutionary science and they kind of make up connections but this is all grounded exactly as you say not just in evolutionary facts but in the biochemistry and how the body works as well and it gets even better as well if you go <laughs> previous before that um if you look at what what foods are available in the summertime it's mostly fruit based stuff so mm. it's less starchy stuff it's more fruit and the fruit stuff is obviously more higher obviously in, in fructose and that actually keeps mm. leptin levels uh, down right so if you look at what's happening there then it's potentially allowing the white fat to continue to build without activating the brown fat and then all of a sudden then these foods decay quickly you know like blackberries black they're only just gone now 29th of september was the the cutoff date when you're supposed mm. to eat those 
then you have acorns which are starchy and then you have other you know grains if you're if if they were even available i don't think they were but if they mm. were and all of a sudden then you have high insulin high because fructose doesn't raise um insulin levels either right yes and not to the same degree anyway so mm. now you have uh, this point where leptin was kept depressed and then insulin pops up excuse me for the mic <laughs> and bang you're in this situation where brown fat is is browning or white fat is browning and then it can be activated by the cold afterwards so i think all these conditions uh, occur in in order and it's this great kind of circannual cycle that you know we talk about circadian rhythms and things like that but there's actually an annual cycle for human mm. beings as well and i think that really needs to be analyzed and this that's what what the don't eat for winter thing is really about it's just spot, we're living in this one kind of a static period which only lasts about a month or two in nature and this is what we've honed in on with our modern uh, recipes, everything, like everything. And, and unsurprisingly, because the modern capitalist machine, in fairness, is built for profit. That's why corporates exist, yeah. it, why all businesses exist. And they will, of course, gravitate without knowing the biochemistry or, or a single iota, what it's you're it's, describing. They'll, yeah. they'll gravitate towards what humans want, yeah. what they drive for. Yeah. But I love the fructose one because fructose doesn't spike insulin, absolutely. Mm. But fructose in its action through the liver can promote insulin resistance, which uh, evolutionarily may have been a good thing because you're going to get more hyperinsulinemia, more of the beneficial building of fat. So fructose is going to do a great job if it's a month or two a year. Mm. But now it's all year round and that's the killer. And you know, the irony, I think, Ian, is people say fruits are good, but a, the fruits in modernity have been bred for 100 years for, for sweetness. Yeah. In, again, in human capitalist competition, they've bred for sweetness. The next guy gets a sweeter apple, you've got to get sweeter. So that's natural. Mm-hmm. So now they're super sweet, but now they're shipping them from all over the world exactly. from climates exactly. where, yeah, if, if your apples are gone in Ireland in mm. September, you can get apples in, in December. They travel Jan- well, yeah. You know. They travel well yeah. with, with a lot of, by the way, yeah. use of uh, fossil fuels to fly them and yes. ship them around the world. Yeah, so yeah. that's another whole story. Yeah, yeah. But that's it. We mm. have the world's harvest. So even if you looked at it from a natural food point of view, we have the world's harvest available to us uh, all year long, 24-7, 365. And it multiplies out then when you do things like press the apple and take the juice out of it and leave none of the flesh behind. So even mm. even these ultra sweet apples would still have. And there's another thing, actually, if you talk about the apple skin itself, um, that's a, there's a compound in apple skin. I, try, I can't think of the name of it. So, so they're going to slip it from my mind at the moment. I know what you're talking it, about, though, yeah. But that actually, um, it, it actually assists with the brown fat development as well. So another autumnal mm. food that has, I'll think of the word, I'll think of the name in a, in a minute. We're preparing but for winter again, the again, same phenomenon. The same phenomenon, yeah, exactly, mm. you know. And so we have this capability of developing brown fat around our necks and shoulders. We also have the ability to, well, some of us have the ability to get a, a tan in the summertime to mm. regulate our, you know, the absorption of light so that we can synthesize D3 and so on. So we are seasonal creatures it can be them demonstrated that we're we're programmed to respond to the seasons mm. so we're programmed to respond to the seasons and if you look at what happens in autumn time i think if you look at what in the animal kingdom bears uh, are triggered in autumn time to, there's a thing called fat bear week in america in you know where the mm. bears they, they have cameras on them and they watch them and see them putting on pounds every day like so you have fat, you have fat bear week in america you have squirrels here you have deers put on 20 to 30 percent body fat Pigs in Spain, uh, pigs in Spain, pigs in space, <laughs> pigs in Spain, um, Iberian pit pork is fed air corn and some species actually develop uh, a layer of fat in their back called, this is called fat back, it's not sophisticated or anything, mm. it's a bit kind of uh, fat, delicious, I'd say. fat shaming, you know, <laughs> but they develop, a, you know, inches thick and it was a delicacy and I, I guess it's because it's on their back, it's acting as an insulation blanket again, f- you know, it's the, it's, winter. It's the roof of the, the body like. And so all, all of these animals are, have one thing in common, what they feed on essentially at that point in time of the year where it's like this is acorns, you know. And so that's why I kind of was focused in on, on acorns as kind of a mm. signature and looked at the macronutrient ratio of that. But again, they're also eating beech nuts, they're also eating mm. r- rowan berries, they're also eating blackberries and they're eating whatever is there. And, and they are inherently gorging, I think they're is gorging. a fair they word. Have no, they have no choice. 
Mm. They have no choice. Um, it's all obviously releasing chemicals in their brain, their bodies, same as human beings. And we are r- ruled by instinct. Like w- people think that we're, mm. make, we're making choices. But I mean, you know, a lot of the food manufacturers have slogans around the fact that you can't actually stop once you start, you know, and, start, you know, mm. and, and if you look at Christmas time and we get the tins of chocolates, you know, when you start one, you can't stop at one. You, you're going to eat a second one and a third one and you're over in your mammy's house or wherever and mm-hmm. the tin of biscuits is there. You're having copious mm-hmm. amounts of tea and you're just shoveling in chocolates and biscuits mm-hmm. and crisps and so on. And literally, you're, st- you're after stuffing yourself from a Christmas dinner and still eating and eating and eating and eating, you know. Just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle-aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources. Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. And, you know, it's not just food reward either, because they don't have to be particularly sweet or palatable. They just need the macronutrient content or or proportions. And that's actually enough. If you have a pile of dry bread there, you won't eat too much. But if you have a pile of dry bread with just butter, Mm. no particular crazy sweetening, you will eat, or at least I always did, a mountain of it. A mountain of it, yeah. And then you realize you're you're quite shocked at how much you've eaten and you look and you go, oh my God, I, I eat, you know, around eight slices. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's nearly half and you, of you, you literally have to stop yourself, you know. To, yeah, and yeah. if you don't stop yourself, you might eat 10. Yeah, yeah. That's an enormous amount. But that was on top of the dinner yes. I used to have at yeah. 6 p.m. This could be at yeah. 8 or 9 p.m. putting on toast with butter. Mm. I could eat maybe eight slices, 10 slices. Mm-hmm. And no wonder I was fat. Mm. But it wasn't because I was going after some super duper junk food no, manufacturer it's, it's, product. No, no, no. This yeah. is bread and butter. And, and we are unbelievably uh, uh, attuned to it and we can make mm. it like we can make it easy ourselves. And when you're making spuds at home, again, you're not going to, you know, the, the plain potato itself is not that palatable. But you throw in cream in on top of it or, or you know, it's, oh, it's a different... It. A different, mm. ca- a different ball game. And you know, you said earlier, Keen, the glycemic index. Yeah, I was kind of fascinated to look at some of those indices. And the baked potato is the worst just mm. because of the biochemistry of when you bake a potato, mm. it's twice as bad as a boiled one. And then you've got these weird things that if you boil it, cool it down and warm it up again, it's actually not that bad because mm. it's turned into resistant starch as mm. it cooled. Mm. But that's kind of a hack. It's a cheat, yeah. It's a, it's yeah, a hack. Yeah, 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 yeah. But these things, and then white rice, something we never had in Northern Europe. Yeah. And now we have not just masses of white or white rice, but we soak it in gravy and juices. Yes, exactly. And, yeah. and that's it. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. I'd eat, like, when I'm doing training for competitions, I would eat white rice, but I'd eat it with, like, uh, breast of chicken or fish or something like that and have a few carrots a few bits and pieces like mm. that with it and the white rice it's on like that is actually quite filling you know but as soon if I had um, go to a Chinese or something like that and the sauce is in I, like the, the amount that they could eat and mm. you can't stop and you're still hungry after like in, you know so it's it's triggering things in us and like you, we know some of the hormones we know the things that are in action and we know the chemicals that are released into the brain you know and it's a, I think it's a fundamental part of us that we we understand our bodies understand uh, that winter is coming and we have no mm. choice in the matter and that's why people are you know they eat one bag of crisps and they have a six pack out and out in the press in the kitchen mm. and they can't get their minds off of it they'll go out and eat another bag and then go out and get another bag and it's just mm. there's no choice in the matter you can't out you know you can't outwit the, the instinct you know it's too powerful and another just a, a kind of parallel with that i remember i think it was robert lustig who said that you know to get obese over 20 years you only need around 30 calories per day approximately excess there's no way we can control what we eat to plus or minus 20 or 30 calories not even hundreds mm. could we control mm. so we need to let our bodies automatically control it because it's like a guidance system in an aircraft no human's going to be able to do compared to the electronics yes but if you eat all these foods all the time your guidance system is shot yeah and now you're left with trying to control it directly by stick yourself which is impossible it's impossible yes impossible. So, so that's the thing if you go on a calorie restriction diet and mm. you, you keep eating those same foods 
it's going to be torture. And that yeah. was the case for me uh, in the past, you know. And me, when I lost weight in my 20s, and mm. then after that I got very fat for the next 20 years, I never even could do it again. Yeah. But I did a bet, and it was a large money bet, and I excruciatingly went through what you described. I just reduced calories, and it was horrifying. Mm. I remember I used to dream about food. I used to go into work, and all I could think of was food, and I'd focus on work, don't think about food and I was doing a calorie reduced diet I lost all the weight and of course after celebrating a 32 inch waist everyone thought it was fantastic a year later I'm back being fat again I didn't even know how it happened yeah but we know now how it happened yeah exactly and that's that, that was my experience as well like mm -hmm. uh, that it's just torture essentially these calorie restrict, restricted diets and there's a lot of things like clubs out there where people are getting weigh-ins and, and that kind of thing and the foods that they're recommended to eat it can be even processed foods that you know that are, that are branded or whatever and they just have the same signature again you know mm -hmm. if you look at the signature of carbs the fats you know some of them are low fat some of them are you know and mm -hmm. and it's just it just makes it difficult you know and you spoke as well keen at the start of our conversation and I, i'm remembering something i forgot there earlier on so you were when you were young quite plump mm. and i mean that probably shows the genetic predisposition maybe when you were young you weren't eating that badly but the plumpness showed your potential mm. and what really annoys me I mean, a lot of things annoy me. What really annoys me is the industry and the industry and academia bodies like ILSI, the um, International Life Sciences Institute, where they join up Danone, Coca-Cola and all these directors with professors from all over the world to help with nutrition. They are taking advantage of saying, oh, well, it's genetics. Mm. They're blaming genetics. And it's a terrible half truth. Yes, certain people are genetically predisposed towards falling into this trap. And some people are not. And they don't put on much weight in spite of this. Yeah. But genetics was never the reason for the problem. The reason mm. is what you describe. Genetics don't change. Maybe in 15,000 years, you'll get a genetic shift. Mm. But in 30, 40 years everyone suddenly got lazy and gluttonous no, and it's slothful. Not, it, it's, it's, it's so not, obviously not true. No, it's, it's just not the, genetics. The environment has changed dramatically, like, you know, mm. and it's become this obesogenic junk food environment where, you know, you have cha there's chains now in, my, in Waterford, like, you know, it's a small town mm. in Ireland, a small city in Ireland, and Abby Kilver saying it's a small town. You're in trouble. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. But no, it's, I mean, the chain foods are there, and they weren't there when I was a kid, you know. They, mm. weren't, they literally weren't there. You couldn't get... You know, and and so that's changed dramatically, and um, so people haven't changed. That's that's the key thing that people, you know. Uh, mm. But uh, yeah, I was predisposed to putting on a bit of body fat, but I now think that getting the ability to put on fat is actually a talent. It's a talent like everything else, and uh, those who can get fat can actually put on a little bit of muscle quicker as well. So there's a you know there's mm. there's an advantage to it if you're doing strength training and things like that to be able to put on a, a bit of of bulk. Mm. So it's just about getting the diet right. I, I think the, the major problem is the fact that we're living in this kind of stasis, uh, this autumnal stasis, and we need to shift our diet and think more dynamically about diet. So my my solution is just to separate carbs and fats altogether by mm. put, by having carbs in one meal a day and controlling the amount of carbs that I eat to a, a certain amount. And good and, carbs. And good carbs. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah, exactly. And then in, f uh, when I have my, my breakfast and other meals and getting the oils and then getting the good omega trees and things like that and a bit of salmon or whatever. Mm. And so separating them out like that and controlling macros um, as well as, as everything. But I could, ha I could eat the same macros as somebody else who is on a, the standard diet, but I'm, by keeping them separate, I'm kept completely satiated. So I'm never snacking. I don't, I don't even think about food. Whereas before I was always, you know, food was always there when, when I have my 11 o'clock because if I had the cereal for breakfast, I'm hungry by 11 o'clock. Now by having the bit of eggs in the morning, I don't get hungry at all and I have to actually think about I better get some lunch now because it's two o'clock in the day you know and I haven't you know mm. we're, I'm in the middle of work and, and I think that if you have a sedentary job it's a good way of working because if you if you've loaded a bit of glycogen the night before and you've done your training and it's in the muscle and it's in your liver and whatever the next day then if you have fat for breakfast you know you're you're basically keeping your blood sugar stable and a bit of protein as well you keep it stable 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 and I'm only having a little bit of a, a spike when I'm going training and that's to have replenishment there essentially that I can mm -hmm. I have glycogen in the muscle so I could train for you know 45 minutes probably without even eating food but mm -hmm. 
to replenish is, is why I'm eating it essentially to refill the stores and I probably am quite fat adapted because the cars are relatively precise you know mm. and I lift weight and do a bit of cardio and I think the, one of the most important things though is for people is to use the what they've they've the strength they get in the gym and the and the cardio fitness fitness to get outside because you know people are going from the office uh, into the car they're commuting and then they're going to a gym where it's indoors and they might be in a spinning class inside in a closed room with lots of mm. you know and it's to get get outside like we have to start just thinking about getting outside more you know oh i agree totally we're starved of light essentially and even with inside the glass if you're near a window in an office very interesting hypothesis papers from teams in america the uva comes through the glass but the uvb that gives vitamin d and many other photo products doesn't yeah so you're getting light all day and you think you're getting light but you're missing whole spectra yeah which is the skin doesn't react when you're inside a window you don't it, get a tan you know or anything like that so you can, you, yeah you're not getting yeah obviously you're not getting the vitamin d because and that's your just skin vitamin, is not adjusting you know yeah and that's yeah, just vitamin so. d and there's other photo products are not even sure what they do but you yeah. can mature evolution at a reason to make them you're missing out on those as well we don't even know what they do and then in your eyes and your pineal gland you're missing out on all this circadian signaling so it sounds like woo to say oh in an office is bad light but let's be realistic about it the science is there it's just no one cares because our modern world doesn't care about anything that, that doesn't have some kind of profit motive attached to it mm. there's no interest yeah there's either yeah. a cure that's part of the business of curing or there's a product if it's outside of that and it's to do with boring old evolution it's be, it's not just ignored actually it's usually ridiculed in a very clever way i think yeah 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 <laughs> i totally agree with you you know mm. so that's it there has to be money and something to, for, for it to become mainstream i guess you know that's the, the you know yeah uh, it's just business just, just business, business. And, and, but mm. like were, what you were saying about the the formula of you know the mixing the potatoes and mixing the the cream mm. in it or noodles with soup or with uh, gravy and, and things like that that mm. form we're actually really good at finding that ourselves you don't we don't mm. need manufacturers to find that we're well able to make tarts at home and mixing the right bread and butter into the the pastry and mix the sugar in you know even to make toffee apples at halloween which is not too far away mix a bit of sugar and butter together mm. you wouldn't need sugar, a bowl of sugar directly like you know nobody really does that i know maybe, there are probably some that they were okay <laughs> and nobody nobody would eat a raw stick of butter again there probably are a few but mm. you know they're, they're few and far between i guess but mix the two together all you got to do Boom. is heat the heat the the saturated fat a bit and then mix in the sugar and bang you have toffee you know so it's the com that combination is key and it's not just sweet it's also the savory part of it as well you know and we're really good at finding that you know that's what i've seen that really and that's why all these junk foods then that are out there and all the pastries and all these things almost exactly match this this that mm. macronutrient ratio it's like 50 percent fat 40 percent carb and six percent protein and i think the six percent protein is quite important because it's like we've tantalized that our bodies know that we're getting a bit of protein but not enough and you know it's like a control system that's hunting yes you know once yeah. it controls it's it's hunting it's seeing the six or eight percent protein it knows it needs more so need but it's double. gonna overshoot yeah i need it's to eat double. Overshoot. yeah so yeah they're very clever and industry is very clever and in fairness i got to say hand it to them uh, i mean they've also got the bliss point which is largely what you're referring to it's the fat sugar combo yeah. Yeah. with a bit of protein but also they'll add in flavors that yes. you also mentioned yes and the flavors will enhance it further to mm. make it the maximum obesogenic potential. Yeah, yeah. And that is the best product. Let's be honest. That is the best product that best fits a successful business. Yeah. And, and it's the worst for humans. Yeah. And you, it, is. it doesn't have to be like mm. this, you know, an evil concoction. It will be found, you know, but yeah. it will be found because if that's what we like the most and that's what oh, we yeah. go for, it's natural. So, oh, you what? know. So yeah, they, so they've just found it by feedback, market feedback. So if it makes the most money, they're going to just keep making it and make it better and better mm. until. And that's why they're always doing these little taste tests as well to see mm. is something you know something better than it was before. Sell and more. We, and we all find it like you say we do it at home. I mean, I yeah. was like a pig finding truffles for twenty years. I would yeah. root out those combinations. I mean, whether it's wine, which is alcohol, which if you add that in, you got more calories and also self resolve falls when you have a couple of glasses of wine. But you add in wine with Chinese piles of white rice soaked mm. in in sauces 
and juices with fatty duck meat. Yeah. And you put it all together. It made me hungry. It's a, yeah, I'm <laughs> salivating here. I'm going to have to get a handkerchief. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's 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 incredibly simple in some ways. And I think something you've done, Keen, which is fantastic, is you've taken a load of complexity and science. And in fairness, you're going it through it here and you're making it simple for the audience, which is what I love. Uh, but when you make it simple, the brown fat, the white fat, the whole seasons, the circadian rhythms and, and the combined macros, you, it's actually not too complex a picture for people to get. If they only internalize this and then separate out and eat an egg, multiple egg dish like I have for breakfast mm. or eat a fatty steak, mm -hmm. you know, or a big fatty fish meal with low carb. And then maybe take their carb later, possibly in the day, and have some potatoes without too much fat. They can kind of have their cake and eat it yeah, almost exactly. with a bit of knowledge. Yes, exactly. Mm. So you're getting a full, like that's the thing. I mean, some diets are quite restrictive and, you know, not people aren't ready for, for certain types of diets, you know, and they're not, mm. not going to accept them. The masses aren't going to accept it. But if you can still have your few potatoes, you still have a bit of rice and you can have your fatty kind of meats as well and have them, you know, and have all the fibrous veg mm. that they're used to and get and like, I mean, there's a lot of goodness to some of the, the, the high GI veg, I guess, like carrots and things like that. They aren't, they haven't got a massive glow, a load of, of carbs in them, but mm. they're quite sweet. You know, they would be considered, um, you know, sugary food, I guess, at some, you know, to some. <laughs> but again, but you can have a big plate of those and have them with something, you know, like a piece of fish or something like that. And ha have your colorful veg, have your peppers, have your mushrooms, have your onions, have, you know, the greens and, and all this. Stuff. And you can have these wonderful kind of foods. And I find that if, if you actually keep the car the, the main thing for me is with, with, when you combine the carbs and fats together, right, what happens is your brain goes into a different mode. You, you turn into an animal essentially, mm -hmm. right? I don't mean that in an insulting way for people, but you become more feral, right? So you will hunt your presses for, for foods. Like if, if there's mm -hmm. a bit of peanut butter and jam, you'll mix it together and you'll, you'll eat 10 of those sandwiches, you know, go, you know, in the nighttime or the evening time. And it shuts off everything else that you, it shuts off, like basically if you're in that auto mode, it's, it's a noise, a noise in your brain and mm -hmm. it's, that noise can't be overridden by anything else. So you'll actually be put off things like meat or be put off things like fish, because all you want is the the sugar and the carbs and the fat and this the you know the save the save these mixes, so by by just shifting that off and shifting it get getting it out of the diet for a little while, the different parts of your brain comes on that turn on and you start actually wanting the other types of food, and you actually start seeking out nutrition then rather than seeking out mm. um, energy. And when you start seeking it, then you'll know then like that one day I'm in the mood for salmon and your body is craving maybe the oils in it or the protein or whatever and other days then you want a bit of steak maybe you're craving some vitamin b or something like that and mm -hmm. you know and some of the b vitamins and then so your your brain actually your body knows i want to eat uh certain nutrients and you know that's more acute in women who are you know pregnant they can mm -hmm. you know that that noise overrides because the the body development inside them needs this these nutrients so they will seek it out you know pick a line as an ice cream kind of thing but you know we have that ability it's just overridden by the, the modern diet i think because all the the siren of autumn is so loud we can't hear the subtle kind of call for nutrition you know i love that i love that the siren of autumn is so loud and we've created a perpetual autumn so the siren is on all the time yeah so what hope do people have bar as i said to internalize this, understand the trick. I mean, there's a trick played by evolution and the trick has been massively exploited by industry. But if you understand it, you may be able to sidestep it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I think when you become aware of it, then, mm. and it took me a long, long time to wake the F up, you know, I <laughs> really did. Um, and when you when you're awake to it, then you'll see like when you when you go into these shops how we're being been exploited, you know. And it's mm -hmm. it's no it's not the fault of anybody. People have to make a living, and you know. Mm -hmm. But we have now got like twenty four hour drive through donut shops and twenty four hour drive through fast food places. You know, mm -hmm. there's is there a need for that type of thing in in society? I don't know. You know, and isn't it interesting, Keen, how does all these efforts on obesity and all these panels and then we're told of course absurdities like meat causes cancer yeah. or meat causes diabetes not meat it's yeah. meat, meat and processed meat 
it's always and processed and, meat. It's always and processed meat. Yeah, you know? and like a saturated fat and trans fats where yeah. they put a natural component of human evolutionary foods in with a man-made false yes. fat. Yeah. Oh, you you never heard him saying like yeah. fruit and cake, you know, because fr- cake is processed or jam, you know what I mean? Fruit it, and jam. Exactly. You know? That's exactly it. It's and always and meat and processed meat. Yeah. Uh, just swinging around to one other aspect of what you were talking about. All of the obesogenic diets for rats and mice that they call high fat diets. I never tire of poking fun at this. It's a disgrace. The high fat diets are actually high sugar, high fat, obesogenic diets with lots of seed oils or modern vegetable yes, oils. Yeah, yeah. They're the perfect mapping of the modern uh, yes, diet. This cafeteria type style diet, you know. Yeah. And if you look at this, there's studies done on and they're showing like that after 60% fat, the, 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 it's not as obes- obesogenic. Yeah. So the 60% fat with rats seems to be a kind of a, a, a sweet spot yeah. for them, fat spot for them. But yeah. do you know what I'm saying? That that 60%, but what's the other 40%? It's not it's not 40% protein. Do you know what I mean? It's, oh, no, they're low, they're low protein. Um, they're high carb, high sugar, high fat. So I think from memory, the equivalent for mice in one of the diets, very typical was the equivalent in a human of 25 teaspoons of sugar mm. and then there was another 30 percent maltodextrin or, or carb very refined and then the rest is fat of which a big chunk was seed oils yes you yeah, know yeah. soy oil or yeah, something extracted chemically like yeah, yeah yeah and those omega-6 heavy oils are in in themselves been shown to have obesogenic yes, nature yeah, yeah. so you've made a perfect obesogenic diet which maps perfectly the modern human diet and then you have some a hole saying oh it's genetics it's it's quite infuriating when you think yeah, about yeah, it yeah yeah and yeah. if you look at like genetics plays a part but it, more and more mm, people these days yeah. are succumbing to the, the you know being overweight Toxic i mean look at look at the, the there wouldn't be industries out there for uh you know for personal trainers and for large diet organizations and things like that if there wasn't a major problem and the problem mm. is getting worse and worse and the reason mm. the problem is getting worse and worse is not because humans have changed it's because the environment has changed and mm. it's changed you know it's you don't have to look very far to see you know we've all these petrol stations appearing on motorways and every single one of them you can go in and get a big sugary latte if you want mm. uh, you can get your big rolls full of you know, it's sauces and, and so on. You have fast food in there. You have the, you know, the sugary, you know, everything is in there, front loaded with you know, everything. And I, if you try and find a piece of fruit in there, you know, try and yeah. put, find a, pea, uh, and a piece of meat in there. Do you know what I mean? You, I, I've often gone in there and the only thing I can get on the way I eat is a packet of chicken and um, maybe some berries if you're lucky during the summertime or something you know you know well yeah but, but if you're lucky you know and in a garage or gas station yeah what i would get actually is offers on cheese slices mm. there's a standard irish cheese two for say four euro and literally just pick up a couple of packets of cheese and just eat them while driving if i have a lunch on the run yeah. because you're right most of the shop is out of bounds and even the fruits that are there are the modern bread for sugar fruits yeah. anyway yeah yeah they're still not too bad if eaten with the skins and the fiber that attenuates the glucose rise yeah. Yeah. but it's not ideal and when we think of fat people or people who are very overweight one thing i work for irish heart disease awareness ihda.ie And of course, we promote the calcium scan. And the interesting thing about obesity is, uh, as per Professor Lustig's work and data, we've got actually more people who are insulin resistant with metabolic distress who are not obese than we have people who are obese. So there's 20% say obese, mm. and a big proportion of them are metabolically in serious trouble. Yeah. But then we have the other 60, 70, 80% of people who are not obese, and maybe 30 or 40% of them are insulin resistant mm. so we actually nearly have more people who are non-obese mm. who are at risk of heart attacks and all the modern chronic diseases because their body just can't handle that you know that type mm. of food they just can't handle it they're you know they get a bit of a bit fat and then that they can't get any fatter and then all of a sudden then boom that's you know? it and i think it was dr ron rosedale said what um oh diabetes is the price you pay for not being able to get fatter yeah yeah. So I don't know, those people genetically, I guess, they're not as quick to put on the white adipose tissue. Yeah, probably enough, know. enough to just get by, you know, and mm-hmm. they didn't they didn't need it to spill over, I guess, you know, they didn't, maybe it wasn't as cold or something or, yeah. they found it, you know, better skins or whatever way they, they adapted to nature, you know. But and, I mean, everyone should have some form of that, it's along a kind of a, uh, uh, a distribution curve 
will be still be somewhere along it. There'll be people on one side or the other, and then mm. the people who can get very very heavy in the middle you know like Samoans and there's certain populations that get enormous and some of them stay insulin sensitive yeah. while they get pretty big yeah, yeah but then again that's just human variation but it's the toxic environment that wherever whatever people you get or whatever genetic predisposition it doesn't matter put them in this environment and they'll either get very overweight and obese yeah or they'll get not so fat but they'll burn up inside yeah with metabolic illness yes exactly yeah so, so it's not it's not mm. natural for anybody you know and mm. especially as you said but it's not just these natural combinations that are available in all our dinners and 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 meals and that but also this you know the seed oils and the high fructose corn syrup which is you know frankenstein sugar and mm -hmm. and so on you know i mean before years ago they used to put apple juice into soda you know to give it that fructosey kind of profile but now it's replaced with this cheaper version of it that's you know chem it's made in a lab essentially it's arguably worse and yeah. then we have all the other examples which prove your very point uh, we have papers from the early 1900s from agricultural groups who published and they had the optimized foods to fatten pigs, skimmed milk and, and grains. Mm, mm. And that was the that was the sweet point, you know, kind of low fat, but with fat in there and grains mm. um, to fatten pigs. Yeah. And yeah, then we yeah. get surprised now when we fatten the human population, mm. you know, kind of yeah. crazy. I know. Yeah. Yep. So, Keen, what would you take as your top few tips then? Um, and you kind of have touched on them, but mm. just to kind of roll it up. Based on your experience, the extensive research you've done, and of course the content of your book, but summarize down to a few key points for, let's say someone who's a little overweight already and is beginning the journey to fix this problem we're talking about. So I suppose a series of steps to take tips and tricks. Yeah, well, the one thing I'd say is you can't out train it in the gym or you can't out train it on the road. And you, you know, that's one of my biggest bugbears is you see people in the gym for two or three years and their body shape doesn't change at all it might even get worse sometimes you know so the gym is and get, exercise is critically important for well-being so getting outside doing the little bit of cardio weight training is the num number one thing i think for it creates first of all a glycogen sink but you're also getting stronger and healthier for for general life and um, so but the diet is the no number one thing so the first thing people should do is just start switching in whole foods into the, their diet as much as possible so cut out the junk and start trying to eat natural versions of what they're currently eating. They can't do everything overnight. You know, if you make a big massive change, it's probably just going to become unsustainable and then you're just going to give up. So I would say make a small change first of all and see how that goes, you know. So maybe it's about cutting carbs out of one meal a day and then see how that goes and if, if that makes a difference. Also look at things like adding sugar to things like tea and coffee and stuff like that and start cutting down and cutting down on the milk and, and, and things, especially things like cappuccinos or lattes. And there's a lot of milk in those. And if you're having three or four of those a day, besides the the extra energy that you're getting in and the, this combination of carbs and fats again with the sugar and so on, there's also, you know, people are a lot of, a lot of people are intolerant to milk, you know, and yeah. grains as well. So it's just shift look at the paleolithic style diet i would say first of all um and see does that do some of the foods in that suit but be careful of the carbon fat combos because you know that's one of the things i noticed when we were when i was in that mode is we were making things like these paleo energy balls and protein balls and they're a mix essentially of things like dates honey oats nuts and that not oats but um, nuts and things like that and you mentioned smoothies as well things that are technically okay ingredients yeah and you could be mixed. having organic uh, peanut butter and you can be having re you know really good oats and stuff but it's mm. still that combination that, that i'm the reason i liked it is because it was hitting that formula which i didn't know mm. at the time but these paleo balls uh energy balls they're made from like uh, dates you know raisins honey things like that and they're mixed up with nuts so mm. like that's exactly what a squirrel would love to get his hands on and to fatten uh, the said squirrel said, up exactly mm. so they are energy balls but you know if you're not doing a 15 mile hike think about it, the better foods for for training i know i know that's uh, it might sound a bit condescending but it's it's mm. real like you know um so the, so diet is number one and separating carbs and fats is the, is the thing for me that if you keep those separate you'll start here with what the body needs in terms of nutrition. So up the protein and um, keep carbs and fat separate and look at whole foods. That's the kind of main thing for diet. Mm. And then when it comes to training, then training should be a few sessions of resistance training a week. It can be body weight, it could be at home, it could be 
in the gym, whatever you prefer, could be a circuit training class with a personal tra- or with a, tra- a group trainer and so on. But just get out and, and, and do something, you know, because especially if you have a sedentary job, if you're work, working in a cafe or, you know, manual labor, it's not such a big deal. But if you're a sedentary job, you have to get out for that hour in the evening and just do something, just even to meet people and, and get out there. And, and start, in the light as well. And in the light as well. Mm. And then I would say, like, especially in winter in Ireland, get out on the weekends somehow, you know, and even mm. if you can during lunchtime or coffee break during the day, just get outside and get a little bit of light on the skin, you know. Mm. Yeah. Very good summary, and and that was technically you mentioned at the end. It was kind of for Irish people, but it, it's also for people in the U.S. and all over the world. It's the Absolutely. same advice. Same advice. And yeah. People who are closer to the equator are lucky as they can get really good light and all. But up north, it's a little more difficult. Yeah. But no, I think that's basically it. And I, I think just another thing is, you know, if you are particularly insulin resistant and obese, that as well as everything you said, if you keep the average carb down lower, it probably makes sense. Or maybe keto will help with appetite. But I agree for most people who only have a medium sized problem, you know, what you said there is, is really the core of it, I think. Yeah. And I think uh, so people are, have so much carb in their diet these days that, is, you know, any sort of reduction is the, is the thing, you know, because the carb is the number one food that raises, uh, it has this massive spike in September and October in nature. Yeah. But, you know, insulin up and leptin yeah. up like But we're thing. never even exposed to cold. So, you know, all this bad, mm. fat, bad activation just doesn't happen, you know. No. So no light, no cold, no nothing. Just sitting on your ass and eating this crap combo yeah. of food. Yeah. Shocking. Yeah. But we're going to fix it. Uh, excellent, Kim. Well, that was great. And just for everyone out there, we're speaking from Dublin, Ireland in my studio and uh, going out all over the world. But I just say to people, Try and subscribe, share the podcast, you know, with these days it's hard to get out there and get this message, valuable message to everyone. And IHDA.ie website to visit and share for preventing heart attacks with the best technology. So listen, thanks a lot, Kane. Thanks, I great appreciate being last up. Thank you. Uh, great meeting you here. <laughs> you too. Turn an arm wrestle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck, guys. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.